Hey friends, welcome back to the library or welcome to the library. Today I have with me author Rachel, is it Corsini? Is that? Okay, that's so unique. I love it. <laughs> that's fun to say. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got started in your journey. So thank you for having me. So my writing journey is kind of like one of these things. I just feel like this is a theme in my entire life. I sort of just fall into things that kind of happen. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to when I it started basically in high school and I went to um, professional performing arts high school in New York City um, in Midtown Manhattan. And I was there because I was a dancer and I was like, all in like ballet dancer. And that was my life. That was my passion. That's what I wanted to do. And gradually, as I continued my high school career, um, I discovered that really kind of wasn't for me. And I had a lot of, um, you know, I was like in a lot of like meetings, like all this kind of stuff. And I was like, you know, I don't know if I really want to do this anymore. And I took a creative writing elective. And I loved it. Um, and so I started like writing short stories and a note like, standard notebook, you know, the yes. Marvel black and white notebooks. And I filled those up and I, and I wrote a lot. Um, but I'd always been a reader anyway. I was, I devoured books, um, way before I even started writing. So my creative writing teacher actually in high school was one who suggested like, maybe I look into attending a writing program. This is something that, you know, she saw that I had talent in and I said, okay, well, you know, I don't want to be a dancer anymore. So I got to figure out what I want to do because, you know, at 17 years old, I had no clue. Yeah. And so then I went to, yeah. So then I went to Columbia College Chicago to their writing, their fiction writing program. And I wrote there and I have a degree in um, fiction writing. It has since changed to creative writing, but it's essentially the same degree. Um, so I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in creative writing. And so I wrote in college. And then I kind of like worked for, um, after college, um, I did a bunch of different jobs and I, but one of them was I did freelance like journalism for a local paper in Queens. So I wrote like on demand, like really quick all the time. And then I got like a steady job and I kind of stopped writing. And then I went back to school cause I hated my job and I became a teacher. I did like all of these crazy different things. And then I stopped writing for a long time and then, um, a horrible thing happened. I ended up in a situationship with with someone that I considered a friend. And I was like, oh, he wouldn't do that to me. Oh, yes, he would. And it was awful. And I like lost, like lost it, right? You know, I was in my early, late 20s, early 30s, sobbing, horrible, hysterical mess. And my aunt was actually the one who said to me, you know, you used to write all the time. What happened to that? Like, why don't you go back to that, like try writing and see like what happens. And that's when I started writing again. Cause I just started like venting like in yeah. a journal. And then I was like, and it's like telling stories and like venting my feelings. And I was like, Hmm, it's like, well, maybe this could be a book. And here we are. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I feel like I just got the best, like tea a girl could get. <laughs> Like, so we're just like, tell do, me everything. Do you want the gossip? And I'm everything. like, yes, I'm here for I it. Mean, I could talk more about that. Like, do you want to no. hear about that? Oh, I'll t I could yes. because, you know, I, like, it's not a secret. I, so <laughs> my writing is very much like write what you know, whether it's like personal situations or, um, and this like, I, and it took a while for me to find my voice, right? Which I think is kind of an important lesson. You know, yes, you can start writing like when you're a teenager in your early 20s or whatever, but yeah. sometimes it takes a while to find your actual writing voice. And it did for me. Like, I never finished a book until I finished Sushi and Sea Lions. And this is where, like, I found the voice that I wanted to write, the things that I felt were important to me. Um, so, yeah, I was, like, totally an emotional mess. Com like, completely at fall, <laughs> totally falling apart. And I was like, but I'm like, do we regret this? Or is this like one of those um, well-learned life lessons we don't necessarily regret, but we just like cringe when we think about it? So, you know, I try not to regret anything that I have ever done or like looking back on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned a lot. I learned a okay. lot. And that is the main takeaway. Like I learned... Um, 
first of all, well, we're going to get like real deep. I learned the kind of relationship that like I want and that I deserve. Mm-hmm. I learned about the way I want and deserve to be treated um, by someone. I learned about, you know, what it means like to feel like comfortable or like kind of at home with somebody. Um, but also, you know, it was important for me to like go through that and like feel that heartbreak so that I knew what I was really looking for moving forward. And I kind of like used all of that in the story. So fun fact, this man has read this book and knows who he is in the story and is very unhappy with the portrayal of himself <laughs> in the story. They're always unhappy with yeah. it. Um, which is fine because basically the way I created the villain, if you will, in the story was I took the bad things about this person's personality and I amplified them. Right. Well, yeah. But then there was a reason why I was drawn to him in the first place and why we were friends. And then it, you know, developed into something else was because there were good things about him. And I will actually put that out there, right? He, he could be very like protective and very, you know, securing and, you know, um, showed care in the way like he treated me and like treated others. And like, so I put those things into Daniela's love interest, Vincent. And I put the things or even like the kind of man that, you know, I wish for myself all went into the character of Vincent or the person that I wished that he could have been all went into that character. And so again, you know, it did, it taught me a lot. And I was able to put down on paper the, the kind of love interest that I wanted for myself and clear. And he has connected and resonated with some of my readers, right? You know, I've had like comments where reviews where it said like, um, like we all deserve a Vinny. We all deserve a Vin Vin. Like he's a good guy. Like he is a good guy with faults, but he's a good guy. And that was what I set out to create. So it did. It taught me a lot about everything. <laughs> Well, yeah. And see, that's the one thing, like, if I could ever instill this into the youth of nowadays is like, we, first of all, culture is so like, or very much hookup, like people don't settle down, they don't. And that's okay. And you know what, like, if, if you're not the person to settle down, that's on you, I get it. But it's also like bouncing from person to person, like you're searching for your happiness in someone else is not going to get you anywhere. Your your happiness comes from you. And one thing that my grandmothers always told me, plural, because I have three or four. um, Yes. When you're looking for your person, if you're the person you're wanting to settle down and when you're looking for your person, you're not looking for the person who's going to give you butterflies all the time. You're looking for someone who's going to make you feel safe and secure. So you want to see see them through like the seasons of life. So like elated, happy on high, sad, depressed on low, you know, bawling, making all of the money and broke, making none of it and struggling. You want to be able to see them through those ups and downs before you really, you know, get into a point of like, okay, I'm going to be, you know, devoting the, the entire of entirety of the rest of my life because you need to know what that looks like for you because you need to know how their emotions how they carry themselves throughout those seasons and that was probably the best advice i could have ever gotten from my grandmother and she left us too soon so like it just sits with me so like thinking about if i could instill that in other people like in, in other young kids nowadays it's just like, like listen you need to think things through witness seasons of life be friends you know find someone who's going to have your back no matter where you are what you're in especially when you're in the thick of it like if you meet somebody when you're down and out and they're there supporting you the entire time you're at your low guaranteed that's at least a true friend if not more and so I agree wholeheartedly. Like, listen, your grandma know, knew exactly what she was talking about. I agree wholeheartedly. And the way I be- like the way I look at it is that it's someone is like your calm, like in the in the sea, right? And I mm-hmm. use that 
to show that with, with Daniela and Vincent in the book, right? So she's yeah. a mess at the beginning of the book. <laughs> Hot mess express. <laughs> she's first she's lost her career. She was a uh, basically a ballet star and she can't dance anymore. Her situation ship has fallen apart. Meanwhile, she thought she was with this guy. She thought she was in love with him. She runs out of money. She has to move into like one of her parents' like rental property apartments back in Queens. So everything is Oof. falling apart. She's everything is it's gone. And um, she meets Vincent mm-hmm. and he is also a mess. And he's going through a difficult divorce. His wife cheated on him. He's dealing with being a part-time parent. He's dealing with financial issues. So they're all like the both of them are not in the greatest shape. But they come together and they become friends and they are a support system for each other. And then gradually Mm -hmm. out of that, this other, this, this like respect and love and caring. And she says about him that he settles her, right? Like there is like the moment where like she realizes like he's such like, he just makes, it makes it, not makes everything like easier, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. and they have like this conversation like before, you know, whatever he says to her because she's crying and she's like, whatever. and, And he says to her, he's like, you know, it doesn't, he's like, love doesn't feel like this. It shouldn't feel mm-hmm. like this. It, it is a. It's calm. It's it's calm. It settles basically like settles your chaos. And so like I kind of like use all of those things to like create this story. Mm-hmm. I will offer this mm-hmm. advice also to the younger generation. Right? There is never a rush. Listen, I am almost forty years old. I am single. Nope. I am living my best life, making, creating book nooks and reading books and writing and you know, crocheting and doing all these things and enjoying my friends and, you know, whatever else. And if someone comes along, yes. they come along. Like, um, it's not the end of the world. There mm-hmm. are, your people find mm-hmm. you. Things that are meant for you, they find you. So everybody needs to relax, stop panicking, mm-hmm. and yep. just like, be. <laughs> and it's all fine. It'll be fine. Everything's mm-hmm. fine. Just be you. That is yep, my yep, yep. And see that another another piece that that my grandmother gave me was one of those. Um, it's a choice every single day. Once you're in the thick of it, once you have your someone who makes it easier for you to breathe when you do the things, and everything levels out for you when you're with them, your day to day becomes mundane. It's the same thing every day. You go through like, especially if you're like my husband's a truck driver. And I'm tech support. So I see the same things every single day. He says the same things every, it, it is the same. So that mundane, it then becomes a choice. I have to choose to like, even if something frustrates me at work, cause I <laughs> deal with people. So people have attitudes and people get really irritable and they take their stuff out on me. It is a choice. I'll leave it at, at work come home and choose to have the right attitude, come home and choose to have my conversation politely, come home and choose to love my person, even though I've asked him to do the dishes five times already and he has not done them and I'm going to have to do them. Even though I asked him to switch the laundry and he just magically forgot before I got home. It is a choice. It is something you have to choose to do once you're in it because you still get that peace even though the mundane is there, it's easy to get irritable because it's the same thing all the time. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that a lot of times we discredit that, right? Like after like the honeymoon phase and the butterflies are over and everything settles Mm -hmm. down, right? It is, it's a continued choice, right? Do I still want to be part partnered with this person? Do I still want to be paired up with this person? And that is also something that Daniela kind of deals with within the story too, as she's like figuring out her life, right? As Danielle's figuring out yeah. herself and Sushi and Sea Lions and stuff like that. Obviously, you know, there's things that happen and then she has to make a decision, right? Is this the person? Is this my person? Yeah. Is this who I want? Is this who I really, really love? Can I? Mm-hmm get over like the 20% of him that I might not think is so great. And so 
it is it is an actual choice. And, you know, and I wanted my characters and I wanted her and I wanted him to feel very real. They are adults. They're adults having adult re- an adult relationship, yeah. right? They they have baggage. They have they have issues. They have stuff that they're bringing to mm-hmm. the table from prior relationships, right? And, you know, insecurities and problems and families and everything else. And, you know, so I wanted it to feel real like that and to show that, yes, like mm-hmm. sometimes you have to make a choice. Either you want it or you don't. And that's it. Yep. <laughs> Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. And it's great that, like, don't get me wrong, the fluffy stuff where it's just instant and they always have the butterflies and it's 10 years down the road and they've got the kids in the house. That, yeah. that stuff is great too because it's nice because it's fiction. Yes. I mean, it is fiction. It's fairy tale. It's it's what we want it to be. But then also, you can learn from the authors who put the harder stuff in their books, who put the reality in their books. And it's so easy to go in and read a story like that and go, I'm dealing with that same thing. And I could approach it this way that character does. And it would ease all of this. Yes. Or it would make it easier for me to or for them to understand or like it would help. Yeah, I you know, listen, I enjoy a good fluffy romance too where it's all sunshine and roses and I want to see them be together and I want to, you know, experience yep. all the spice and everything nice. Like I you know, they I love that too. That's just not like the stuff that I write. I mean, don't get me wrong, they you know, they do mm-hmm. fall in love and it's wonderful and it's beautiful and some of it's funny and you know the whole nine, right? However, you know, there is some mm-hmm. there's like re- there's a little like grit to it because they're struggling, like they're human mm-hmm. beings. Um and that's also why, you know, talking about like romance in general, I guess like you could we could shift like into like publishing and how that works. Like one of the yeah. reasons why I ended up at a small press was because agents that I sent this book to, aside from like the 10,000 rejections, um, <laughs> but the ones that did request a full, a lot of my feedback was, we don't know how to market this book because it is more heavily women's fiction, but the basis is a romance. Um I got a lot of feedback on the fact that, you know, Danielle is a 30 something year old woman and yes, she has sex with other men. And that was a huge issue. I was like, well, it's not like she's cheating on him. This is, you know, she's going through some stuff and she's kind of figuring things out. And, you know, that was, that was a number one, you know, because it was like, it's not this floofy doofy romance that like, he's the only man that she's ever been with. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. that was an issue. The fact that it was so internal that some of her issues were, you know, a little off putting. Um, so I had a lot of feedback on that, that it was too cross genre. They mm-hmm. didn't know what to do with it. And so I ended up again, like at a small press because they were willing to take a chance on a cross genre book, right? I mean, it's spicy. It's a, it's a little deep. It's definitely funny. There's some funny stuff that happens to her in the story. Um, but they're at the core of it. It is a love story. And, you know, so that was kind of difficult, but you know, we could talk about the issues in publishing forever. I mean, the things that are going on in publishing and the changes, Honestly. And, you know, anything else, but Yeah, that was my main, that was a big thing for me when I was putting out this book. Um, Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to change it to be just a straight up contemporary romance. I could have just to sell it, but I didn't want to. That was not, that was not. Because then you're just another contemporary romance on the shelf. Yeah, you're right. Like then it's just another one that's like plunked down on the shelf. And, you know, what separates me from everybody else? Listen, small presses have their own challenges. I mean, you know, the the marketing that you would get at a trip, like a, at a larger press, not say, I, I won't say traditional press, but a large press, right? It's yeah. not there, but I'm available everywhere, just like anybody else's, you know, and I sort of had to like yeah. do my own hustle and figure out how to get it out there. That was the, that's like the only thing, if you want to talk, you know, big big four versus yeah. small press. Um, and I will warn everyone mm-hmm. about that. You have to do your own mark. You have to market yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Tough. Yeah. 
Yeah. I remember the same with, with not being with a press at all and having to work through KDP for Amazon. I mean, yes, I honestly, (laughs) I work, I work with quite a few indie authors who solely do it themselves through KDP and they, Amazon is so finicky, so finicky. Like, you can only change your release date like once, and then if it doesn't go, like you can't ever upload it, or it can't be uploaded with the same title, or you have to wait so long. Or, and I'm just like, why? We're allowing, and it. I don't think it's necessarily a conscious thing, but we're allowing those four, those big four presses and one company to have a monopoly yes. over the entire publishing just market in general. And I've started to see smaller presses pop up, like people who are like, I went and got like two or three degrees for writing and for publishing and I'm opening my own press and like I will deal with the the only other small that I've seen between um like one that was created from someone on that I saw through TikTok she has she has her own trilogy as an author and she started a publishing company Mm -hmm. and then the only other one I've seen outside of that from KDP is like Ingram Spark. Yes. And they're a problem too. (laughs) Yes, Ingram, yes. They're, you know, and actually, you know, my publisher has experienced like this issue. Um, Amazon, like Mm -hmm. they, they they want, um, they want, the Zon wants total control. They want control. Yeah. So um, if you're in, like, if you're publishing with a small press, right, like I did, one of the things that mm-hmm. there was an issue with Amazon speaking to Ingram when my book released. And so it was not um, putting through like the paperbacks and like it came down that the paperback wasn't available. The only way to make it available during my release was to publish through Amazon. So she had to, she had to publish it through Amazon to be sold on Amazon on my release date. Um, which is in, which is ridiculous because I mean we know for yeah. a fact it's easy to get books from Amazon. It's it like you know people are not going to bookstores and they're not going to Barnes and Noble even the way that they were before. I mean Barnes and Noble is still a powerhouse, but like you know indie bookstores are struggling yeah. to stay open as well. And so you know the Amazon is kind of like. A, acting a little bit as a gatekeeper to all of this material also. And again, you have like mm-hmm. the big four who are, have this monopoly on the material that we read, but also you have agents who are the front line as well. And I do believe mm-hmm. that there is less risk taking because, you know, and I can't blame them because agents work on commission yeah. and they work hard yeah. and it takes them a long time to get a book published. So you're uh, to mm-hmm. go out on sub and to see if it gets picked up by an editor at the big four and what the deal is going to be and how much money they're going to make, you know, so they could, they could be working with an author for six months to a year writing revisions and then send it out and it's on sub for another six to eight months and they have seen no return. They have yeah. gotten, gotten paid nothing for working with this author. It's a good faith effort, which is what your agent is supposed to do. They're supposed to work for you, right? But ultimately, mm-hmm. they do want to see it sell. So they're going to want books that are hopefully going to be commercially viable. They are look. They don't yeah. want you to fall onto the B or C list. They are looking for an A-list book. And you can't blame them. They would like to no, eat. Yeah. They would like to also eat. That would be great. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, and that's like, there are so many, and I'm not, I do this. So I'm not knocking anybody who do this, but there are so many people who either can't get in touch with an agent or don't want to, or aren't willing to go through the publishing, um, whether it's a small press or one of trying to get Mm -hmm. to one of the big fours, just because they don't want to lose a certain modicum of control. And so I work with some indies that are like, "Um, I need a beta team because I need help with edits. And I'm like, 
I'll help. I mean, I, ha I have a yeah. measly two year degree from a community college, but I'm really good with English. So I help and like, I'll use Grammarly. It's a free program. So <laughs> I'm just like anything I can do to assist is good. But I just feel like there, there's this disconnect. Like if you're not part of this club for yeah. the big ones, then you it feels like you right. just don't matter because you can't it's harder for you to get put into the bookstores because you know even though like people aren't buying books as much from the bookstores there is still a certain section of our community right. that exclusively shops in bookstores because they're not in into the community the way you and i are they're not in the social medias facebook instagram you know so they're just going based off what they see on the shelf and then from there it's like well you're missing the probably millions of other authors that are writing their own version of all of this or okay it's okay it's all good it's all good it's clearly i've like just been moving locations um no, I mean, you're entirely right. Like, there's some people who don't follow BookTok or Bookstagram or whatever. They don't see any of this stuff going on. So they're just going into a bookstore and, like, looking at a table. And, yes, in a way, like, it does. It keeps you out of the bookstores. It's very, very hard to get shelf space. Like, that was, like, my mm – -hmm. I um, I mean, I am not in Barnes & Noble. Um, I made it to a, into a few indie bookstores, yep. that I will say. But almost all of my sales have been because I promoted myself on social media. I've done podcasts. I've done interviews. I've done all of these different things. And it's gotten out there and, like, someone noticed my little book and, like, decided to read it and then recommended it to somebody. You know, so I do feel that for in – a, in a genre that happens to be – I'm not even going to lie. We know that my genre is saturated – in a genre that yeah. happens to be saturated. I think my little indie book did pretty well. Um, yeah. And I, you know, and I hope that it continues to do well, that I, you know, get a few more sales here and there. I am working on the next one. As we know, like, that's like, yeah. Yeah, that's like the next, right? That's like the next thing. Don't worry. I'm just a slow writer. I, whatever. It's, it is what it is. But I'm working on the next one. So, like, I, even my publisher said, you know, once you publish the next one, sometimes people circle back and will read your first one. So then you end up getting more sales, right? You have people that are waiting for this next book. You have people that will notice your next book. So, you know, it's everything's. I think, gradually becomes easier and easier. But still, you're right. There is a monopoly on the, the books that are pushed out for consumption, right? Yeah. You know, and the – the way that the traditional publishing industry does work. And, and I, and, and I think us as like little indie authors, I think I wouldn't say little, but indie authors, I think it's either you acknowledge that or, you know, you just start to get angry and you like, you're like, I'm never doing this. Or, but I don't feel that way at all. Right. I, I enjoy writing and I'm just like proud that I managed to even get a book published. I, it, it, aside, yeah. from that, aside from that, right. Like the whole, like, the, it, it's such a competitive industry. The fact that, like, somebody took mm -hmm. a chance on my book, my debut novel, I think is an accomplishment in itself, you know? Oh, 100%. You know, and I think, like, people sometimes, they, like, compare themselves too frequently to others mm -hmm. and their journeys. Um, yep. And you, you can't do that. Like, you have to accept your own wins and, and yep. be proud of them. That's my big yeah, advice. Yeah, another word to the wise is comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. It absolutely is. It will. Yeah. It can destroy you, actually. You know? Yeah, so easily. You lose yourself in comparison because then you're driving so hard that yes. you don't look yes. up. Like, oh my gosh, look, I have to, it's just. Uh, look yeah. up people look up look around you like books okay and I say this and I'm like I obviously I'm a very avid reader I am literally sitting in my book nook when I do these yeah. podcasts and I do these podcasts to talk to other readers and to talk to authors and influencers and you know just spread the word about people's things that they're reading new books that are coming out and all of this but at the same time I want to encourage people look up like when you're going yeah. somewhere 
we have a tendency to slump our shoulders and look down at our feet or not pay attention to our surroundings. And this is not just a safety announcement and precaution situation, but it's like, look at the other reader who is sitting across from you. Or if you go to the bookstore, you know, actually start that conversation. All of us are introverts for the most part. Say something, (laughs) even a hello or an, oh my gosh, I love that book. Or I need to read that one too. The easiest of conversations, a smile can change someone's day. We are not meant to be like solid, like solid solitude beings. Like we, we are meant to enjoy and have conversation and just be in like, mm. <laughs> I, I call it like consuming the world. Right. So yes. the reason why I'm a little like non plus about my next book taking so long is because in between writing, I've been like, I call it like consuming the world, right? Like yes. I've been, I've traveled to like visit my parents down in Florida. I've been going out with my friends. I've been enjoying Enjoying my life in between, mm-hmm. discovering hobbies, discovering new things that I enjoy to do, right? Like yesterday I built a book nook. Like, yeah, could I thank you? I know hey, it's like super nook. cute. <laughs> yeah, I know it was like super cute. I really like had a lot of fun, right? See? Yeah. I could I have taken that three hours and like plucked away like and like killed my brain by by writing for three hours? Yes. But mm-hmm. I wanted to like explore something new, right? I got myself a Lego kit. Like, you know, I'm like, you, you have to put, you have to like put yourself out there. Uh, yeah, I got the, okay. You're going to laugh. I got the, the big, like the tuxedo cat one. No way. Yeah. yeah. For, any, for anyone who did not catch what we're geeking out about, this is the new Lego sets that they've decided to come out with where you build things. And I have nearly every style flower on my bookshelf. So I have I have the daffodils, I have the Japanese cherry blossoms, I have the tulips, and I have the sunflowers. I'm just waiting on the roses. And then my mom got me this really cute, um, it's not Lego brand, but it's an off-brand, it's still Lego, okay? Don't come for me, people. But mommy, my lovely mother got me this really cute, um, it looks similar to a tulip, but it's like a daffodil tulip. Okay, okay, okay. I hear you. <laughs> so it's it's a daffodil tulip mix and it's got this really cute um ladybug sitting on it. It's like a potted plant with a ladybug sitting on the it's so cute. It's so cute. Oh how cute is that? Yeah. So yes. I got so I'm gonna do the the Lego tuxedo cat. Um, my dad, my parents are coming up to visit me in October. And so I said, dad, we're going to do the Lego together. So he kind of started laughing. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. So like in between writing, I think it's also important. Like people forget you have to live. Like you also have to live. Like you can't just like plunk yourself down in your office somewhere. And then all you do is write like, you know, and I think that that's really important. So that's why I'm very much like, okay, so it might take me a year or two to like finish this draft, but I'm also living. And that's also where I get the inspiration for my writing too. So like if I'm yeah. literally mm-hmm. just holed up here in my apartment, nothing's going to happen. There's no writing. There's no. nothing is going to happen. Cause I'm not doing dumb stuff. <laughs> I mean, oh. <laughs> I'm not being, I'm not being, I'm not, you know, I'm not being slightly chaotic, but you know, as it is, I, th- that's like a part of my personality. I'm like a small bit of chaos. Um, but you know, it, I think that writers should also take that as a note as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have to live. You have to also live because it, I, it just broadens your horizons and, and helps you to add things to your stories. Right. Yeah. You know, I think there is something to be said when people, not necessarily that like, you know, I'm not talking about like, I'm not knocking other genres or anything because you bring all of those experiences to the table when you write fantasy and sci-fi and historical and all of that. Mm. Right. Because I think people can 
tell, your readers can tell when things are authentic or you have felt certain things or mm. you understand mo- uh, people's motivations or you've had things happen to you and you're like drawing from these things. That, those are authentic experiences. And readers can tell when you're lying to them. Yeah, 100%. I, I, they're smart. They are smarter than you think. They can tell when you're lying to them. And so you, you have to you have to let yourself live. And I think that's that's the important lesson yeah. here. And not even, even just if you do lying, but like, not even just outright lying, but fabricating or twisting. Like we're, we obviously know you're not going to put everything real life in your book, but there right. is a difference between something that is wholly exaggerated and something that is not. And, yes. um, and that's, that's made even more obvious by those of people who cross genre read. So if I'm not sticking because I am a romance person through and through, I tend to lead to the dark romance side. It does not mean I do not like the light and fluffy because I still read the light and fluffy in here recently. I've just needed the light and fluffy, but tr- true to my heart, true to my heart, the, the dark, morally black and gray. Yes. Yes. The, the dark romances just sit somewhere inside my soul a little bit better. But I also read fantasy, so I can tell the difference between something that has been created, like fantasy, something that has been exaggerated massively, like morally black, morally gray, dark romance, or then something that is just, we're yes. glossing over some of the, as in like a fluffy romance. There is there is a very much, and it's, sometimes it's like, yes. we're just not going to acknowledge it. But we also, sometimes it's like, ah, uh, that's wrong. And right. there are those readers who will very much come out and be like, um, excuse me. That No, there, there are those because they just have the audacity. But Yes, and they will put that stuff in a review. I mean, listen. On I blast. Know, on blast. I mean, listen, I know like you're not supposed to read reviews as authors. I know it's like really terrible. But I've had, I've had, I had, I think, what was it? One one star review who was really <laughs> mad at the ending of the book. So I'm not going to give it away. Like, she couldn't believe that Daniela would forgive him for this and, like, go back to him um, and, like, make that decision. And it's a fictional story. They pretty much forgive everybody for everything. Right. Um, anyway, so, you know, she was, like, really, really angry. And she's like, he's supposed to be goals, whatever. And I got, like, a one star review. I was like, damn. Okay. And then the next one, right. I, I, you know, whatever. I was like, right. Um, and then the next one was, um, I got a two star review because she said she couldn't hate it all the way through because of Reggie, who is the cat in the book. That's Danielle's cat. She has a cat. Um, she has like an ancient, she has like a 16 year old cat that takes thyroid pills and it was like super <laughs> grumpy and like very judgmental anyway. So she's like, I could not hate it because of the cat. She was a great character. But she gave me a two-star review because there is a scene which, now looking back on it, like can actually be seen as problematic, and I and it's it's a it's a moment mm-hmm. that could have been cut from the story. But again, it's also like not everything happens on the page, and you don't know the kind of communication or whatever that these two characters had off page. So Daniela, as a former ballerina, right, has been struggling for a while, and Vincent sneakily gets her tickets to go see Romeo and Juliet performed by her former company Ouch. and her former partner, James, who is a gay man. Well, okay. well it all okay. makes sense though. It's like a little circle of healing, right? It's a circle of healing. So it does make sense within the context of the story. Like she needed to go, like this is something that she needed to do. So her former partner and very close friend, James, it happens to be a gay man. And he, they danced many, many ballets together. Now, Vincent and James off page, because otherwise the book would be a bajillion years long, had sneaky text message conversations and whatever about getting the tickets so that he could drag her to the ballet. So he did this for her. And so they got to know each other as friends, right? And have met and whatever and like yada, 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 right? So there is a moment before they go into the theater where Daniela is still trying to get out of it. And she's standing there with Vincent and James. 
And she's like, whatever, yada, yada, yada. And then eventually she kind of cries or whatever. And then they're going to go into the ballet. James, I know this is very long, but it makes sense for the explanation. James, Vinny plays baseball. So he's got a really good butt. And Daniela comments on his butt the whole time throughout the book. James, like countless sports members or like good friends or whatever, reaches out and slaps, taps Vinny's ass. And he goes, I have been dying to do that forever. Then they say goodbye and he goes in or whatever. And Vinny's like, Jesus. So Daniela laughed. Okay. The two star review was for because of that moment. Because the reader said that they had not had enough communication. This man barely knew him. And it's basically like a sexual assault. I was like, okay, could this have been something that I could have cut out? Absolutely. But mm-hmm. their communication happened off page. Clearly, they had been having sneaky discussions behind Daniela's back about doing this for her. Because James yeah. had the tickets. James had the tickets. They were there. They showed, she met Vinny there. They were there together. And she tried to get out of it. So there was clearly some kind mm-hmm. of a relationship already there. Just not like a gajillion scenes about them building up yeah, this relationship. Yeah. Because it's like a side thing that's, that would not have propelled the plot. So, yes, readers feel very strongly about certain things, and they are entitled to their opinion. Reviews are for readers. They're not for me, right? So I kind of laughed about that, and I was like, okay, I'm going to, like, brush that off, but I will consider these things in the future, right? But to me, it was like a bro It happens all the time. And 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 to to put more from someone else and i have not read the entire thing to give entire context so please forgive my however that (laughs) seems like a a great moment that you need like a comedic relief situation because she's going through such an emotionally distraught and heavy moment that like that comedic relief is something that was necessary Yes, she's kind of having a meltdown. She wants to get out of it. And he's like, girl, do you know what he did to get these tickets? You know, and like her her very good, her, her only person still from that company that still has contact with her, her former partner, right? And so, it, and it is, and it's kind of funny and like, you know, whatever. And it breaks that moment because it is a very emotional moment. Mm-hmm. Even when she's sitting there watching the ballet, it's very emotional because she can't do it anymore. Yeah. Doesn't mean she doesn't love it. She can't do it anymore. And so, you know, uh, so yeah, so I kind of like when I read that, I said, okay, well, everyone's entitled to like feel how they feel about that. Mm -hmm. And and, and now we move on, right? I'm I'm not one of those authors. I don't, I don't like, I've seen so many shady things where like authors will like scream back at readers and reviewers. And I... I feel very strongly that that is highly inappropriate. Yeah. Um, you know, yes, we know you feel strongly about our characters. We know you care about our books or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or, you know what, if you give me a crappy review, that is entirely your opinion. And that's fine. The, I, in no way, shape, or form should authors be responding to those reviews. Yeah. Ever. I mean, I do think that it's funny if you decide to for. use them as marketing. Like, yes. Okay. <laughs> That's hilarious. And especially yeah. oh for people who are just mad about small little bitty things yes. that, I mean, because the one star reviews for, for like HD Carlton on haunting and hunting Adeline, I mean, they are hilarious. And I, how could you not? And I mean, some of the stuff for some of the other dark romance and even yeah. just romance in general, because a lot of people get so mad about how easy they fall in love or, right. I mean, the runs one stars are just hilarious most of the time. So I I just I find it great and it is good marketing. I mean <laughs> a lot of people say that um, no publicity is bad publicity. So No, like I agree with you, right? Like I I think it's funny. Like I think like, you know, what like what do you expect, right? It is also a book, you know, and as authors, we do make choices. I mean, to be fair, and also I am a little worried too, which is also why this book is kind of a little bit slow going. This book is a, the second book um, 
is about Trisha is about Daniela's best friend and she is far more serious mm-hmm. and her storyline is is um much darker um and it's also it's a second chance romance um there is uh, those are my favorites i know i'm really excited and nikos is like such an adorable cinnamon roller you just like want to pinch his cheeks he's adorable um and but and they both have major issues like he is an uh, alcoholic who's in consistent recovery right like he's Mm -hmm. but he's like uh, you know this is like years out from his you know whatever he's consistently gone to meetings and stuff like that and he's you know he's like on the up and up and he's got takes care of like a lot of plants he's got a dog like he's doing all right you know he's good um but that's something very consistent, right? Like he is a recovering alcoholic and that will never leave him. And so he has his own issues, right? And she mm-hmm. has some things that have been like creep up from the past that have to do with like men and sex and sexual assault and, you know, things like that. So there are, there's, yeah. it is, it, there's some dark, dark stuff that is happening in that book because you know, yes, Daniela deals with some dark things, but it was also my first book, and I deal in women's fiction, and these are women's issues. And Trisha deals with some of this stuff and is actively dealing with this stuff when she does meet Nick and her decisions. You know, she's actually a very logical, very calculated person, um, and thinks things through a lot. So, but her decisions, right? Um are really important and like what, what she decides to do. And her arc is a little difficult because she deals with certain things that'll like never leave her. Right. Or like Mm -hmm. decisions rearing up from when she was in college that she made and then continuing in her adult life and, you know, moving forward. Um, it'll, it'll all work itself out because I ultimately, I enjoy a happy ending and that's my ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Right. Not a perfect ending, a happy ending, right? Nobody ends mm-hmm. perfect. Nobody is perfect. Um, but so that's also, I think, part of the reason why this next story is taking so long because it is much more serious and it's much darker than Sushi and Sea Lions is. Um, yeah. And so, that, and I think those kind of stories take, to- take longer to write. I don't necessarily want to be in that headspace all the time either, right? Because I write, yeah, I, no, write first, yeah. I write first person. So I have to be in her space to write about her story. Um, so, yeah, it's just it's been a very interesting ride overall. Let's just put it that way. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so we know you said women's fiction and it kind of your first was kind of a romance. And obviously the second one will be the same. Are you ever, have you ever wanted to or considered another genre? I get asked this so many times. Believe it or not, I get asked this so many times. So there are actually two genres that I have considered writing outside. And if I ever did, um, I would definitely probably have a pen name because my books are adult, right? Um, I'm not sure if these would necessarily be adult. So, well, yeah, the historical fiction, number one. But I actually started writing historical fiction before I even moved into women's fiction and contemporary. And, man, is that a lot of work. All of that research that you have to do, (laughs) right? All, uh, you know, making sure that things are, you know, as accurate as they can possibly be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And I really love, like, the industrial era New York City, like the early, late 1800s to the early 1900s. It's, like, one of my favorites. But I like, like, you know, the dark stuff, like the underbelly. And so, like, this book was, like, it's all, like, like heists and – political intrigue and like Tammany Hall and like all that kind of stuff. Um, it was, it's fun, but it's a really, really difficult. The other genre I would probably get into is, so my favorite book of all time is Peter Pan. And I have always wanted to do a Peter Pan retelling. I've always wanted to do a Peter Pan retelling or reimagining of Peter Pan. Um, but I have read quite a few, and like my favorite one of all time is The Child Thief by Brahm, and it's pretty damn near perfect. It's way dark, but it's very well researched. Um, he brings in stuff from Greek mythology, um, and 
I'm like, man, I don't even know if I could top that, but I could try. But I would have to write under a pen name. I can't be having like people reading my smutty lady fiction and then all of a sudden turning around and going, oh, I like, like, oh, Peter Pan retelling? Is it is it going to be like Emily McIntyre's Hooked? No, I don't do that. But, you know, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, or the historical fiction, but the historical fiction would probably be dirty too, because you know, you know, everybody was doing everybody, especially like if you're talking about like brothels mm -hmm. and gambling and drinking and everything else. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> you know what? What era? I really, I really enjoy. Okay, so not that I've had a whole bunch of research. Not that I've done a whole bunch of research, but for some reason, I am very enthralled by the 1920s. Yes. And my. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, can we just forget about all. Okay. Somebody said that we're repeating all of the decades from the 1900s okay maybe maybe we are all right but it doesn't feel like right now in the 2020s that we're just doing partying all the time it does not feel that way i feel like this is great depression Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm -mm. No, no. God, I wish I was. Can I just put on like little two or three inch heels and go dance and forget? Oh, well, the 20s are fun. It's just a giant party. Yeah, gangsters. Come on. Let's be real. Let's, like, I mean, I want to party in the 20s. Mm-mm. <laughs> I no, well, no, same. It, but <laughs> my mortgage is I, probably no, not anything. No, I was going to say it feels like it's consistent existential <laughs> crisis. Like I don't want to. What are, what are people listening? talking about? New York. Like I'm a millennial. Okay, I have been told uh, this is an unprecedented event at least four freaking times in my life. So I don't even believe anybody anymore. There's been two financial. Cr First of all, you know. I'm the 9-11 generation. There's been two financial cr cr crashes. There was a mm. pandemic. Like, you know what? I'm just out here doing my thing. Mm -hmm. But I ain't roaring 20s in and up of any anymore. For it's real. not happening. <laughs> I was at the grocery store this morning, and this is a side note for anybody yeah, who same, is listening. I'm same. sorry. You're just going to be living in the past. But um, I was at the grocery store this morning, and some old man was walking by me, and he said something about making a, a couple hundred thousand a year while somebody else sits on their butt in an ivory tower and makes a couple hundred million. And I looked at my husband, and I was like, like, I you can't even do that. Listen, you live in Texas. I'm in New York. What I live I on Long do? Island. And like, if I go out, it's like twelve, fifteen dollars a drink. I can't even go out. I was like, and I don't care how many up. phone calls I have to field. I have a mortgage. What needs to be done? <laughs> you let me know. I'll do it. It's fine. I have a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> I care. I'd be like, all right, listen. Uh, oh, listen. I have no well, experience, you know, well, most likely. But if I we're like, you know, we're not even getting to like the cost of living and stuff. I mean, I do also happen to live in probably one of the most expensive places in the United States. Um, it is what it is. But uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, I don't know. And like, that's another thing. Like, I touched on that, like, again, like in the book, too, is like the money and like kind of like running out of money, like all this kind of stuff. And it's just, you know, this is life. Like, 
but I want to roar it up. Mm -hmm. Can someone like be a benefactor or something? Can we go back to that? <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, where do I sign up for that job? <laughs> yeah. Where can I sign up? Somebody, find me a link. Find me a link. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, God. That's another thing. Because, I mean, in all honesty... And I understand if if they don't know who you are, you know it correlates That's with what you've thing, got right? already like, and going think, and like, all we of these things. This but either. I think I mean, like, who can live off in of publishing? That? Like we very one rarely talk about this. Anyways, like you like, know, there are very very few people in the United States, that get no matter an where you deal. live. Right, that can actually survive Many off of writers, one income. And, you get, and when I say one income, not I mean our, our not feeling like you have to sell books or you know, clothes I, or something I when you're not using them or you're done with them, not feeling like week, not like doing I, crafts know, on the side because City, you want to, and then selling school. like legitimately um, one it's a hard income job. household. It's tiring. It is nearly um, impossible. You know, and I like writing is not my full time job. It's my, it's like my little side gig, right? If I relied on writing to eat, I would be dead. Um, and I mean, and yeah. this is even with people who have, who've signed contracts with the big four. Those advances when people don't know who you are yeah. or you don't have a sales record are not big, they are not enough to live on. And nobody no. talks about that, right? They are not even enough to sustain a writer mm -hmm. for a year. Those advances. Yep. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah yes it is speaking from someone yep. like yep. i don't have a spouse i don't have another full-time salary that helps me right and it is very 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 yep. very difficult very it is very difficult, you know, um, thankfully, like I manage. Okay. Right. Like I'm all right. You know, yeah. like I'm not, I don't have like somebody breaking down my door and dragging me to debtor's prison. You know, that's great. I wouldn't, that wouldn't be fun, but, um, you know, it, but yes, like that's like a very real thing. Right. And so writers are working other full-time jobs or are doing, um, a bunch of side jobs to make up their mm -hmm. salary so that they can continue to write. Um, and I'm not talking about indie authors or self-pubbed authors. I'm talking about people that even sign with big four, right? Because they're advanced. It gets paid out in four pieces. Yep. Um, and it is definitely not enough to sustain them to sit at home and write another book. They have to continue to do other things. And again, you know, this is like you said, it's hard for anyone to like be like make it on one salary. But again, you know, when you're creative and you're expected to output your creativity and you're expected to produce, having mm -hmm. the financial backing in order to do that is sometimes what is needed to create good work. And yet, 
even yeah. these companies that have millions of dollars, these major publishers don't provide that yeah. for their authors. So, you know, well, again, and that's why you know, a lot of authors have of decided to serialize their stories before they actually go with the full published version out with a press or with Kindle. Edits, I mean, edits, KU, because um, it, it's just, you know, if you um, want to put your book on net or gallery, like a net Wattpad. gallery, a book bubble. Wattpad is expensive. used to be free, and now are it's very expensive. serialized payments. You could go for and thousands and thousands of dollars. Kindle has their own serialized payments with Kindle Vella, and there are plenty of serialized sell, apps that do the same thing and it's like that is how people end up being so able to money. make and enough so like that's like to survive you know, month to month one of my things when i did decide to go with on a small press of, because they were you know going having to do a side things. job like i wasn't on net so that they can Galley spend you know a little bit of time at work review, and still be fine, able to spend enough time deal. to make sure they get but enough like, chapters you know out. however i didn't pay for my cover i didn't pay for edits i didn't pay for a book like i didn't so those things yeah. or a book I have funnel, so many authors like, that have done things, Kindle Vella. Those are huge. And one of them, I didn't have five thousand dollars laying around to make sure that my book came out at the caliber I'm that I wanted I'm going to plug this in to. because I think it's really neat. So one of them that I you used know, to so work like, with, her name's Emily Shore. She ended up deal doing so well on industry. Kindle Vella. So that's part of the reason why I went with small press. It's you helped know? her pay for medical bills for her family. So it like it is just so touching. It's so touching because it's like so many people have bounded behind her mm -hmm. in support of <laughs> so many people have like stepped up behind her in support yeah. of her and her stories in her books and she was able to make the serialized work for her in a manner where like it's and she'll if you're in her social media she's like you know we paid off these debts or you know this is you know i made enough in this month to cover this expense or like <laughs> yeah yeah it's yeah, wild it's, man it's, the hustle is real the writing the the writer life that's it was real. amazing it to real, me and like sure. there are some others that pulled out yeah. of ku that went into kobo or elsewhere and started selling individually um, that were able to start like after they pulled out the royalties from other places and just selling them themselves, they were able to make more so that they could stay home and write. I was like, hey, Zon, hey, Zon, you notice this is a problem, right? You see the middle person here? You do realize you are the issue. Mm -hmm. Again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, see that stuff makes me happy. <laughs> Love it, please. Gosh, this app. Right. <laughs> Gosh, this app. Listen, I'm gonna make it work, okay? I'm gonna do my due my due Aww. diligence here. So I have one or two more questions. Um, I have a lot of authors that I've talked to. I've asked this. Whenever you write, do you have like an established plot line that you can follow, or do the characters take off on their own? <laughs> Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, sometimes, yes, mm -hmm. you know, like, and, you know, I think like, you know, each story can like have its unique home and like, you have to like, be, you have to like feel it out. Right. So, um, <laughs> And like I said, like for me, you know, it's not about like the money that I'm making. I just like want people to read my book. That's all. I just want people to read my stuff and be happy mm -hmm. and, and that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. This is like horrible today.
Okay. They're just yeah, they're just running wild until we can piece it all together. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh god no um I'm a do pl- you um do you read okay, other so stories while you write like i, it's, I, I you've like been a, a reader for a both, while but i wouldn't but... even say it's like a plan plan it's like i see certain things that i want to have happen or believe like sh- will happen in the story and then like i make like a mm-hmm. bullet list at the bottom and then like i go and then i start writing. I also don't write linearly. I write like scene by scene. That's like taking my attention. And then I start connecting everything Mm -hmm. together. So my first draft is legitimately a disaster until I start like moving things around and plugging stuff in and like, whatever, it's like a giant puzzle. Um, and then, so that's how I write. I'm not a full on well thought out Mm -hmm. planner by any means. That is not, that, that's not how I write. I like to discover stuff too. But a lot of times, like when I started with Sushi and Sea Lions, I knew the I have, end. I had that one somewhere. Um, and I knew like I knew when they first got it's together. Like here. I knew certain things. Same thing with this with my work in progress. I kind of know I know exactly how it's gonna end. Um so yeah, there's like certain mm-hmm. things I do know, but not necessarily the full on how I get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, they're running wild. They're, you know, they're living through their traumas <laughs> and it'll be okay. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I do, I do. So actually I'm like, okay. um, I'm like a vacation reader. And then also, you know, like I said, cause I'm a teacher, I'm like usually reading the stuff that I'm teaching my students. Like right now we're reading, um, for my AP class, we're, we're reading their eyes. We're watching God, which I haven't read in many years and it is a great book. So, um, anyway, but yeah, so I do read while I am writing. And this summer I read about three books right now. I'm reading a winter in New York by Josie Silver. Um, I finished reading. I can never, I get them some confused oh i finished go hex yourself this summer and another one um yeah i love those books have you read those they're so i read them both i read go hex yourself and um what the other one oh my god they're like i love i love them i love those books by jessica claire i think they're adorable so, i can't wait if i'm I looking want to back here because i'm like i know one. i've got some back um, here that i'm getting the same that, vibe I, that'll from. be a purchase oh so, and i read do your worst Lana by Harper rosie dannon top and april 10. asher they so both good. Have that book was so good it like, was so fun witchy. um and also like i mean they also had their issues too which i so, really really like Lana Harper um, has. Jo- so one? Josie Silver is a little hey, more a witch, in line with the way back I in write a spell things. and so from bad to curse. So if you're not kind of into like it, it, like and this the, this is the oh uh, uh, yes the internal Lana Harper, and like it's a witches of this little grove novel female like each of them are from it's, it's the same less, city. I mean and the romance is still important, but April it's less about the same thing. romance. And there's someone than else that I read recently, like, but like her kind of like a small town witchy, but also like a the one. Let's see if I can find. It. City. She the one had I a read the last relationship time. that she's trying to leave behind, uh, like all of this kind of stuff. And then obviously there's like the love stories included in it, and it revolves a little bit around a gelato recipe, which I think is really interesting. Um, and it also takes place in New York, which is like you know my favorite stories. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of um, mm-hmm. so that's part of the reason why I picked that up to read it too, because I was like, is my writing like in the yeah. Is there like a comparison here? And Josie Silver is definitely a comparison to the way I write. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay. I just, I'm like, I love these are these stories. Ooh, those oh my look like gosh. something I would love. I never thought, well. That's a lie. I did think. I just was a little Delulu in my thoughts sometimes, thinking that like, oh, it wouldn't be that interesting. Okay. Like, you're not Lana into witches Harper. and witchy things. And I'm like, actually, yes, you are. Excuse me. Yes, you are. Okay. And it's okay. 
it comes from <laughs> the, the heavy sigh when I looked at you. It comes from the repressed Christian Southern upbringing. So when you're raised in the Bible Belt, <laughs> it's very hard. It's very hard to set some of that aside and be like, and they're all connected. Oh, I know Everything those books. I know, I know what you're talking about. So, those are pretty. Um, I haven't read those, but I've thing. seen them all over. I think that, like, those are kind of also on my list. But like not, I said, right now, like not a I'm good, back but to not work, a bad, it's, but it's hard it's for me to just, just sit down this and read. ominous, like... Um, I'm being watched yeah, over. Yeah, so like you know, I just, just let like it with be. The chaos going on, but and I'm just like I'm as long as you're not causing like me said, harm and you're not bringing plane, me bad energy, so I have like, like and you're just being a little so like protective. I said, like, that's this, fine. Like I don't know who you are or what you are, but it's fine. But I managed to take off some of it, and now that I have, it doesn't. There's like there's not this delulu. I won't like that just because I was raised in a Christian Southern thing. That's what it was. No! Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Because... Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I hear you. I can I can hear you on that. You know, listen. Um I I was definitely raised like very different. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a New York like Queens <laughs> born bred raised Italian girl like, you know, roaming around New York City. Definitely, you know, my parents were like we're like Catholic, but we're like Catholic. You know, like I got forced to like make confirmation and stuff because like that's what you do, but it's not like you know, it's not like my parents were like for like in church every single week. Like we didn't do that. My now my cat my Catholic grandmother <laughs> did go to church all the time and whatever. Like you know that was that was her thing. I mean she she passed away. She was almost when she passed away she was yes, like ninety eight years old. So I mean you know you're talking yeah oh, you're talking fantastic. like you know she was a she was a force. Oh, Grandma Ida was a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> Um, and was I feel like hilarious. We should, I feel like we should wrap love, on this really great, love, fantastic love, love, moment. Love my grandmother to death. Is not it being was stupid. Um, and also, as like a side note, she was very, very excited. For that anyone I was finally a book. listening, listening to this, when we get to the end of next week novels. and you hear she the final production portion, just know that Rachel and I have been battling with the app that I use. One book a week because you know she would get tired. That I used to record I this stuff. But anyway, when she it found been out that I was in out, so it has been a wonderful book, hour book, and a half. She said to me, to you, um, "We're gonna jump now she while goes, we can." Rachel, is are there going to be dirty bits? And I said, "Of course, Grandma." And she said, "Oh, good." We really did. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, and, and I'll make was, sure to get all great. of your information in the show notes so that I mean, everybody can find all of your. I mean, it was like the best moment ever. I was like, Grandma. I love you. Like I said, Grandma, I'm not even embarrassed. I was like, good. And uh, I said, you know what? I'm going to read you a sneaky peek. And she said, yes, please. <laughs> so, yeah, it was. It was a very good moment. I, it was an awesome moment. It was great. She was really great. She was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
We have fought the good fight today. And this was so great. Thank you so much for having me on. We talked about so many different things. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Thank you so much.